Hello, I'm Robert Emmett Hernan. I'm the head of Bluestacks Productions, the publisher of Irish Environment, an online resource for environmental matters on the island of Ireland. We're here today for another in our series of conversations on environmental matters with Professor Sharon Turner, Professor of Environmental Law at Queen's University in Belfast. You're very welcome, Sharon. Thank you, Bob. Tell me, why did you get interested in environmental as opposed to other kinds of law? Well, that's a good question. I suppose my when I came to Queen's first, um, I was I suppose working primarily in the field of European law and in the early stages of my career I remember somebody asking me would I do a short piece on the evolution of environmental policy in the EU and in particular looking at how Ireland had uh, responded to it north and south and I suppose I was always kind of broadly aware that Europe was working actively in this field but I'd never really sat down to look at it properly my sort of initial interest was always European and constitutional law mm -hmm. And that really, as I started to look at the scale of activity coming from Europe and the scale of inactivity at domestic level, um, at a constitutional level, it was fascinating that this was an enormous policy field being developed by the EU, but yet there was a deafening silence um, from the, on the two, two sides of the island. Mm -hmm. And I suppose at a personal level, I've always been interested in environmental issues anyway. And I, spart I started then to kind of investigate more and more deeply why it was mm -hmm. that the two Irish governments were, appeared to be essentially ignoring their legal obligations under European environmental law. Uh, in, in your resume, it indicates that you worked when you were with the Department of Environment for two years as the senior legal yeah. advisor mm -hmm. on lifting the crown immunity or the implications of lifting the crown immunity for the water service. What was that issue and what triggered it? Well, I suppose, I mean, the reason I was seconded mm -hmm. into the Department of the Environment, with, in particular, more sort of systemically, was because the Department and Northern Ireland government and ultimately UK government was facing. I don't know, numerous different cases being mm -hmm. taken by the European Commission against the UK because of failure in Northern Ireland to implement environmental directives. And one of those directives that they were really struggling with here was the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive. And they basically had, I suppose it had about 15 to 20 years to implement it. And mm -hmm. whereas Margaret Thatcher had led the privatisation of water and sewage services in England to pay for the infrastructural investment that they would require to meet the directive, Partly through, I suppose, just the lethargy of direct rule and partly because it just simply wasn't a priority, mm. Northern Ireland had done nothing about it at all. So by the time I was being seconded into government, they were facing a series of very significant cases um, mm. because of their failure to provide secondary treatment for major agglomerations across the jurisdiction. Mm. And in a sense, the then it was the first of all government then and more laterally the I suppose Peter Hayden's direct rule government and Paul Murphy's direct rule government realised that if they didn't I mean in a sense they had to agree with the European Commission a major infrastructural investment over several years mm. to bring themselves into compliance in law in terms of legislative change and in terms of infrastructural change and regulatory change and um, the two major issues for Northern Ireland first of all they had to pay for the, they had to raise the money to pay for the infrastructural investment but they also had significant problems with the structural delivery of the service in terms of compliance because mm. water and sewage services in Northern Ireland were in the Department of Regional Development. They were being provided by central by, by the Crown essentially. But because of the doctrine of the principle of Crown immunity, you had a major what was then a major polluter because they were in endemic non compliance with the directive. <coughs> so they were in a sense, delivering a service that was a very polluting service, mm -hmm. but DOE's environmental regulator couldn't take criminal prosecutions against them or enforcement action because of Dock Crown immunity. Mm -hmm. So they had to, mm -hmm. one of the several reasons for externalizing responsibility for the provision of water and sewage services was to lift Crown immunity. It had become a mm -hmm. very, it had, a source of, it had become a source mm -hmm. of significant embarrassment and it was a legal liability mm -hmm. um, because in addition to infrastructural compliance, they had to show that they were in regulatory compliance and they had to lift Crown immunity to allow that to change. And how did they do that? Was it by regulation or...? No, they basically... Um, it was, a, it was mm. kind of a twin-track approach mm. of per persuading the European Commission that they were spending sufficient money and making sufficient infrastructural mm. changes to deliver mm. the type of infrastructure that would produce secondary and tertiary mm. treatment where required. Mm -hmm. But also, they took the water service out of central government and created Water Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland Water, mm -hmm. which is a government-owned company. It's not privatized. It's sort of in a sort of a, 
uh, an interim legal entity. It's not mm-hmm. centralised, but nor is it privatised. Mm-hmm. But it's sufficiently externalised to be mm-hmm. uh, to not be crowd immune, and that meant then that the Northern Ireland Environmental Agency could regulate it normally as per is re- mm-hmm. as is required under European law. And could prosecute it yeah. if necessary. Yeah. And and uh, when did that take place? That that transition. Uh, I think it was the first of mm-hmm. April. Uh, 2006 that it, it, it went and it became mm. effective law and um, I mean it, it is a it is a transitional period I mean the, in a sense nor the Northern Ireland Environment Agency couldn't in a sense simply apply normalized regulation immediately because you were dealing with an entity that had an enormous amount of historic non-compliance mm. and because of historic under investment so they have a statement of regulatory intent that does allow the, in a sense, almost requires a regulator to take historic mm-hmm. underinvestment into account in their prosecution policy. Mm-hmm. Um, and my understanding is that as long as the, as long as the company, the water company, is meeting its improvement um, schedule, mm-hmm. that is taken into account mm-hmm. in terms of the prosecution policy. Mm-hmm. The whole question of environmental crime in mm-hmm. Northern Ireland, and mm-hmm. I think across the whole island, is a very, very vexed mm-hmm. question. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly. When we did the review of environmental governance for Northern Ireland in was it 2006 seven, um, there was a huge groundswell of dissatisfaction mm. with the purchase that the regulator had on mm. polluters, mm. Um, and it was one of the reasons that people were in a sense calling for an independent regulator so that in a sense cases would be taken more appropriately. Mm. But the judiciary in Northern Ireland too were being criticised because they were seen as not imposing rigorous enough fines to deter pollution, mm-hmm. and it is an island-wide problem. But we at Queen's are doing an extensive analysis now on mm. looking at the, I mean, as so the Northern Ireland Minister decided that they would not create an independent agency, that she was going to deliver improvements in regulation while keeping the regulator in central government. Mm. And I suppose we're looking now to see, has there been a system, mm. they have invested in certain changes and we're going to see across the major areas of regulation, nature, waste, water, mm. um, to see what changes have occurred since Arlene Foster's decision. Um, and is the government actually investing in improved crime handling? Mm. Um, and eventually that project will be extended across the whole island because there are certain quite significant cross-border problems there as well. Now, one of the issues that's come up, certainly in environmental organizations as well as others, uh, for a number of years, we're pushing for an independent agency comparable to the Republic of Ireland and the UK and, and elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not what happened. It was just the Northern Ireland Environmental Agency was spun off from uh, the Department of Environment, but it's still basically a government agency. But one of the issues that comes up is, what does it mean for an agency to be independent? If I mean, wh- what is the difference between the way in which the Northern Ireland Environment Agency operates and, say, the Republic of Ireland's Environmental Protection Agency operates in terms of its independence? Do you have any sense of that? Well, I suppose in a mm-hmm. sense, uh, an independent agency would, would operate quite differently. I mean, it, I suppose the core um, difference is that the people who work for the agency, I mean, if you're, if, if you are the, the current environment agency in Northern Ireland mm. is staffed by civil servants mm. and even though by statute the environment mm. agency or the Department of the Environment is required to comply with environmental laws and deliver the enforcement of environmental law, a civil servant's primary focus is the protection of the minister mm. whereas if you are working for an independent environment agency your primary focus is the protection of the environment. Mm. and. There's both a sort of a psychological change, but also, if you like, a structural and organisational change, that if you are working outside of government, um, the Environment Agency is, they have a changed focus in terms of their operational focus, but also they have a freedom to articulate their position that they don't Mm. have as civil servants. Mm -hmm. Um, And in a sense, the lack of independence draws the agency into a perceived, if not a real, conflict of interest. that the regulator is, is making regu- quite important regulatory decisions that are under the very direct control of the minister. Mm-hmm. And certainly in Northern Ireland, that lack of independence has led to a lack of transparency. Mm-hmm. And because of poor regulatory performance, there's a lack of trust. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly the environment in Northern Ireland, from a regulatory point of view, has been very neglected um, with a lot of um, very, very critical reports coming from the auditor's office. Um, the Public Accounts Committee and academic community and professional organisations expressing serious concern that proper enforcement is not being delivered. 